Hi, and thanks for joining us for our webinar on carbon markets for U.S. row crop producers, opportunities, and challenges. I'm Jim Mintert, director of the Purdue Center for Commercial Agriculture, and joining me today are my two colleagues, Dr. Nathan Thompson and Dr. Carson Reeling, who are both assistant professors in the Department of Agricultural Economics here at Purdue. I want to take just a minute to congratulate both of them because this will be the last time they get introduced as assistant professors. Effective next week, they're both being promoted to associate professors with tenure here at Purdue, so congratulations and uh, looking forward to working with you for, for many years to come. So uh, we want to take a look at what's going on in the carbon markets. It's been a hot topic for some time in, in U.S. agriculture, and a lot of misinformation out there, maybe a lack, a lack of understanding. So we're going to review some of the principles behind these carbon markets, talk about some of the challenges being faced. We gathered some information from uh, producers with respect to the Ag Economy Barometer Surveys, uh, we're going to share all that with you and then maybe draw some inferences and recommendations to, uh, towards the end of the program today. So with that, Carson, walk us through a little bit of where we're coming from and why this is an issue in agriculture today. Sure. So we're going to start off just talking about the different types of carbon emissions that uh, your average firm might emit. Uh, policymakers tend to divide these into three different types of emissions. Uh, they call them different scopes. And the, the scopes uh, go up in order of the amount of control your firm might have over those emissions. So they start off with scope one. Scope one emissions are just the direct carbon emissions that come from your, your plant or your uh, factory or the, the cars you drive around in your factory. These are the emissions that you have direct control over. Uh, going back to scope two and three, these are emissions that uh, in some cases you may have some control over them, but you have a, a smaller degree of control. Uh, scope two emissions are indirect emissions that uh, basically come from purchased energy input. So if you're running a, a, I don't know, some sort of factory, you have to buy a lot of electricity to run your equipment. You might have to pay for heating and cooling or steam power, whatever the case may be. The carbon emissions that are generated as a result of, of providing you with those uh, energy inputs, those are in uh, scope two emissions. You can control those, obviously, by just turning your lights off or using less electricity, but you don't control the technology that the people who sell you your electricity use, and so for that reason they say they have uh, less control over those. The third type of, uh, of emissions, uh, scope three emissions, these are the ones you have the least amount of control over. These emissions are generated by your employees commuting to and from work every day. They're, um, you know, the, the emissions generated by the suppliers who sell you the inputs that you use in production. So you have very little control over these types of emissions. And it's actually these, these two uh, indirect emissions, the scope two and scope three, that a lot of the uh, offset markets that we're gonna talk about today uh, are trying to account for. Okay. Uh, we also wanted to just spend a couple minutes here talking about how these markets work so that people watching can get a really good sense of what's driving demand for carbon offsets and carbon sequestration in ag. Uh, generally speaking, we divide, uh, well, I divide these, these carbon markets into two, diff two different types. Uh, the first we're going to talk about are basic regulatory markets. Uh, as the name implies, these are carbon markets where there is a regulatory driver. There is a state or federal government that is saying, we have too many emissions, we're going to start a carbon market that is mandated. Everybody has to participate if you're a, a facility over a certain size, and that's how we're going to control uh, carbon emissions. Uh, the basic way these things work, I've got a simple little diagram here with some animations you can follow along with just to kind of get the idea. Uh, but you might have some uh, regulatory, regulatory authority, excuse me, uh, US EPA, state level EPA or whatever, that comes along and says, all right, we've got too many emissions being generated from a particular industry, power generation, uh, you know, whatever the case may be. We want to control that, so we're going to set what we call a, uh, an emissions cap. An emissions cap is just the total limit on the total carbon emissions that this industry can generate. Then we're going to issue permits in accordance with that cap. So that's the, the little rectangles you see there on the screen. And these permits give the permit holder the right to emit one unit of pollution for each permit they hold. Okay? And usually when we're talking about carbon, the, the units of emissions are just uh, metric tons of carbon equivalent. And the idea here is that if you're one of these regulated polluters, you can pollute as much as you want, but you have to have one permit for each unit of pollution you generate. And generally speaking, these, these caps are binding in the sense that the, the amount of pollution that's being generated is larger than the permit cap, 
And so uh, when they set that cap, there's, you know, you have to scale back your emissions somehow in order to, to meet this cap. So in your diagram, Carson, up there at the top, you've got the big cloud. We're going to shrink that cloud down a little bit in response to the regulatory cap, right? Exactly. Yeah. So actually, you can think of it as all three of these firms are going to collectively scale, uh, shrink their clouds and scale back their emissions. Uh, but to do that, there's actually three different ways that you can meet your cap. The first, uh, and, and you've already triggered the animation there, is that you can actually just scale back your emissions, right? If you find it very cheap to scale, you know, change your technology or turn the lights off or whatever, you can just scale back your emissions yourself. The nice thing about permit markets, though, is that they actually offer you the opportunity to effectively pay somebody else to reduce your emissions for you. Uh, Specifically, if this first guy on top here finds it really cheap to abate his emissions, he can scale back the amount of carbon that he's generating, and these other two polluters might say, okay, hey, uh, you've gotten rid of your carbon, you've got some extra permits floating around that you don't need, why don't you sell those permits to us, I'll pay you some amount up to what it would have cost me to get rid of that carbon myself, and what you'll notice here is that, you know, those bottom two firms, they're actually polluting more than they were before, but collectively, we're still meeting our cap, right? We've just changed the allocation of who's doing the polluting. So from a societal perspective, you've met the objective of reducing carbon emissions. Exactly. Even though individual firms might not be reducing their emissions. Exactly, and this is kind of a controversial issue within uh, carbon trading or any type of pollution trading because there's this argument uh, among some that, hey, it's unethical because you're just taking money and, and using it to pay for your bad behavior. You're polluting when you really, you know, under this program, you should be cleaning it up yourself. Really, I mean, they're, you know, ethical and, and uh, distributional consequences, of course, matter. But from a, a social perspective, we're just changing who pollutes, not the total amount of pollution. And that's, a, that's an important issue. Uh, so finally, uh, the other alternative for getting rid of your carbon is you can actually go outside the carbon market and buy offsets, right? We're still gonna pay somebody else to get rid of your carbon for you, but you're gonna go outside that market and find some, uh, sorry, some unregulated firm to get rid of that pollution for you. So in my example here, if you click one more time, you see you know, farmers, for instance, they generate some carbon just like everybody else does in the economy. That's how we keep things spinning. So farmers uh, might adopt a conservation practice, no-till, cover crops, scale back their fertilizer applications. And if they can verify, quantify how much carbon is being abated by those activities, they can sell that, that reduction as an offset to some firm that wants to pay them for it. So that's the, you know, any combulation of these three activities can be useful for trying to figure out how to, how to meet those emissions caps in these so, regulatory So Carson, markets. although you've uh, given us an example how ag could per, uh, participate in one of these regulated markets, I think I, my understanding is that in, in fact, that's not going on right now with respect to agriculture because of the lack of verification and standardization on the ag side. That's exactly right. So I, I gave this example here just as a, you know, because that, that's who's possible. watching these things. Yeah. yeah, it is theoretically possible. Anybody who is an unregulated firm uh, that can scale back their carbon could, could conceivably supply offsets. But in these current regulatory markets that have existed up to this point and the current ones that do exist, uh, not a single one of them has involved agriculture, row crop agriculture, as a source of offsets. We're going to talk more about the verification and standardization issue later. Yes. But that brings up the issue as to why that might be important mm -hmm. in terms of creating some additional demand for carbon credits, credits coming out of row crop agriculture, right? That's right. Okay. That's really important. So there's lots of examples of, of these regulatory markets, <laughs> some that um, have had more success than others. Uh, one of one of, if not the earliest example here in the United States was the Chicago Climate Exchange. Uh, this ran for a period of maybe seven years, uh, I think, believe 2003 they started. They're defunct now. Uh, this was a voluntary uh, market. Companies would sign up, commit to a particular carbon cap, and then they could trade permits just like I described on the, on the previous uh, slide there. Uh, the problem with this one, of course, was that it um, it just never really got going. There were, there were some trades initially, but after a while, uh, carbon price, uh, permit prices, excuse me, were very low. People sort of lost interest, and there was a period of about a year there where just nobody was trading at all, and so eventually they just decided to fold shop. Uh, overlapping just a little bit, in 2009, the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative started. Uh, that one's still going, uh, and it's actually a, a fairly successful example of a carbon trading program in this uh, country. 
This one's mandatory. Uh, there's a number of states in the Mid-Atlantic and uh, New England that have signed up to participate in this. If you are uh, major sources of carbon, you are probably going to be regulated under this uh, agreement that these states have created. Uh, and this, again, it's just a carbon market exactly like I described previously, and it's still going, and in fact is growing. Uh, the state of Pennsylvania and uh, North Carolina, I believe, have both signaled interest in joining this coalition, coalition of states to, to cap carbon emissions. Uh, finally, Car California has its own example of a cap and trade market. This has been going since 2013. It's a state level carbon market. Uh, major sources of electricity, uh, industrial sources, and fuel distribution sources. There's about 450 of these uh, different types of firms in the state. They're all reg regulated under California's own carbon market. And I think I heard you say earlier when we were talking about this, uh, Carson, that the California program does have a small element of agriculture in it with respect to dairies. Is that correct? That's Yes. So this, testing my knowledge a little bit on this one, the... Um, Historically, agriculture has played a small role in these markets, but I believe in the case of California, um, it's limited to certain types of agriculture. So the example you just gave, if you are a dairy producer and you install a methane digester, you can participate or, or act as a source of offsets. But that's one of the few examples of agriculture getting paid to reduce uh, or provide carbon offsets in a regulated market. That, right? That's true, yeah. The other major example would be uh, agroforestry. Uh, but otherwise, yes, opportunities are very limited. Okay. The other type of uh, carbon market are what I'm just going to call uh, non-regulatory or voluntary offset markets. And these work roughly the same way as we had before, uh, except instead of factories and power plants doing the polluting, uh, it's going to be companies, uh, you know, technology companies and other groups. So if you uh, click the button there, it's, you're replacing the, the factories here with Technology firms like Apple or, or Microsoft, uh, big retailers like Walmart, they have all made commitments to sustainability, right? They, they care about carbon. Maybe they've got shareholders that are uh, very interested in sustainability, customers that are demanding increasingly uh, sustainable production uh, for the goods that they buy. And so these firms have all voluntarily decided that they want to offset some of their carbon emissions and probably those state... Uh, scope two and three emissions that they generate throughout their supply chains. And so the, the mechanics of this are largely the same. These guys have, you know, they don't have a, a mandatory cap, but they have some voluntary goal that they want to achieve in terms of their emissions. So they just go out and they pay farmers or other groups to scale back their emissions and, and do that on their behalf. And so it's these non-regulatory offset markets that are really creating the interest and the yes. opportunity to earn money for carbon credits in row crop agriculture, Exactly, right? yep, exactly. So uh, if we go to the next uh, screen here, what we see is that there's actually a, a number of these markets that have popped up, some of them just in the last year. There's a huge amount of, of movement in this industry. Uh, Indigo Ag, Nori Incorporated, uh, and all of these ones are unique in that they are, to my knowledge, the first that have allowed row crop agriculture to serve as a source of uh, offsets for carbon. And so one of those is a little different than you mentioned the Bayer Crop Science one, right? That's right. So Bayer Crop Sciences, uh, they're starting their own carbon inset market, which is distinct from an offset market, uh, only in that um, it's basically an offset market within a company's own supply chain. So, you know, Bayer, of course, they have a nice long supply chain, they're a you know, huge company. Rather than buying offsets from some farm wherever, right? They're going to go to farmers in their own supply chain or they're going to go to retailers in their own supply chain, input suppliers, and pay them to abate their carbon. And in so doing, they're going to, I guess, in, in some ways, try to make up for that critique of carbon trading that I mentioned before. You know, everybody's worried about ethics and, and things, right? Why would we just pay somebody to do something that we should be doing? These inset markets are, are to try and get around that, uh, making sure that companies take responsibility over their own. Yeah, they're really looking at it from their total supply chain perspective exactly. and say, we're going to reduce the carbon impact from our supply chain, not just our firm. Yeah, from, from our, and, and we're going to do that ourselves. We're not just going to pay somebody else to do it on mm -hmm. our behalf, mm -hmm. right? So, Nathan, You've taken a look at some of the practices that are eligible for these payments. You want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, that's right. So basically to qualify for some of the programs that, that Carson just talked about, you're obviously going to have to make some changes to your production practices 
that would be practices that are known to sequester carbon. And so here on the slide, you know, I've, I've listed a number of, of things that get thrown around in terms of agricultural practices that uh, are known to sequester carbon. When we think about row crop agriculture, which is really what we're focusing on here today, the two that really get the most traction as far as practices that can sequester carbon and are, are kind of the, the hallmarks of the programs that are currently out there are a reduction in tillage or no-till and then implementing cover crops. Both of those practices are scientifically shown to sequester carbon. And so we're gonna spend a little bit more time really focusing on, on those two as the practices that people are probably interacting with as it relates to participation in these carbon markets. So you've also taken a look at how prevalent those practices already are. That's right, so you know, this will become important later as we talk about some of the um, aspects of what creates uh, a, a uh, quality carbon credit or a carbon offset. But essentially, it's important to understand where the practices are today. So starting with no-till and conservation tillage. And so these are USDA's definition of, of those two practices. The, the figure here uh, is county level data on the proportion of acres, uh, cropland acres, that's important, the proportion of cropland acres in a, a given county in the United States that are currently using either no-till or some sort of conservation tillage as defined by USDA. And so the, the darker shaded counties there would be counties uh, that currently have higher levels of adoption for no-till and conservation tillage. And so you can see that when you kind of aggregate up across the entire United States, uh, that over half uh, of U.S. cropland acres are currently in either no-till or conservation tillage, which is, is a pretty sizable portion. A lot of that concentration you can see on the, the map there is focused in uh, kind of the Corn Belt states. Um, and so oftentimes you kind of, you know, hear these discussions of, you know, well, what is the role of agriculture uh, in, in kind of the uh, climate change discussion? So just for some context, uh, I tried to put some numbers uh, to that, right? So Making some assumptions on carbon sequestration, I use the USDA NRCS's Comet Planner tool. For um, no-till, they uh, estimate that at 0.3 or 0.31 uh, metric tons of carbon per acre per year. Uh, that would equate to about 10% of U.S. passenger vehicles for current conservation no-till adoption, right? That's, that's about how much uh, carbon that they're sequestering in, in no-till acres currently. If we kind of extrapolate beyond that and say, okay, well, what if we put all U.S. cropland acres into no-till? How much carbon could we sequester then? And again, using some assumptions on, on those rates of sequestration, that would be about 123 million metric tons of carbon a year. Uh, and putting that on a different scale, which is you know, U.S. carbon emissions, that's about 2% of total U.S. carbon um, emissions from all sectors. And so you can see that, you know, while obviously um, there is a positive impact that can be had, we need to be maybe a little more realistic about what the role of agriculture can be in the broader kind of climate change discussion as it relates to carbon sequestration. And so, uh, Carson, is, this kind of brings up a controversial topic because one of the issues is additionality, right? Mm -hmm. That's right. And so to the extent that we're already doing these things, Farmers would like to get paid for things they're doing, mm -hmm. right, that are contributing to reducing carbon. The companies that are involved, though, only want to pay for additional changes in practices that reduce, that amount to um, uh, providing additional reductions in carbon. You might want to talk That's about right. that a little bit. Yeah, so formally we, we say additionality is this idea that if we are going to pay you to do something, it better be something that you weren't going to do unless we paid you, right? So. The, the map that Nathan's put up here is uh, troublesome in the sense that if you look at where all the corn and soybeans and, and a lot of the row crops are being produced in the United States, what are those numbers? They go up to about 94% of you know, land, uh, ag land in those counties is already under a lot of these activities. So this is gonna re raise uh, further questions about you know, the effectiveness of these types of programs. If only 2% of US emissions are covered by ag and 94% in some places of those emissions are already being sequestered effectively. How big of an impact might we be Yeah, this is one. Here? This is one of the more controversial things and in, in with respect to the carbon emissions. And, and let's talk a little bit more about this because you've taken a look also at uh, cover crops, which is also a hot topic in this area. Sure, so we hear a lot about cover crops and cover crops fall under this umbrella of, of potential carbon uh, sequestering practices. The story here is a little bit different, especially from from the perspective of the additionality story that, that Carbon just told or Carson just <laughs> told, 
Um, and so again, you're right, this is the proportion of cropland acres in a given county uh, that are currently planted in cover crops. So you can see there's much uh, less of the dark colors here with the main concentration being kind of in that Chesapeake Bay area. Uh, and there's a lot that goes on in the state of Maryland as it relates to, to uh, nutrient leaching and, and water quality. And so there's, there's, that, that makes sense if you're not familiar with that. There's plenty of things out there that you can go and look at what the state of Maryland is currently doing uh, to incentivize cover crop adoption. But looking more broadly, right, adoption is, is relatively low. And so looking at kind of aggregating across all of those counties, right, only about 4% of U.S. cropland acres are currently planted in a cover crop. And I should say currently, uh, this is from the 2017 U.S. Census. So, you know, that's several years old and, and cover crop adoption has certainly uh, been increasing, but that's kind of the, the most current county level data that, that I could get my hands on. Um, now again, kind of putting some context to that level of adoption. Um, so making an assumption about how much carbon is actually sequestered uh, by cover crops, I used again the USDA NRCS's Comet Planner tool, which assumes uh, somewhere around 0.4 metric tons of carbon per acre. Uh, current adoption obviously is relatively small, and so that equates to only uh, about 1% of U.S. passenger vehicles currently, right? So uh, the current cover crop use sequesters the same amount of carbon uh, as we see from 1% of U.S. passenger vehicles. But again, extrapolating that out and thinking, okay, well, what if we could get more people to, to use these practices? Uh, for cover crops specifically, if they were planted on all U.S. cropland acres at that same assumed uh, carbon sequestration rate, we would sequester 147 million metric tons of carbon, which is slightly higher because of the slightly higher rate per acre of sequestration associated with, with cover crops as compared to no-till. Uh, and again, putting that some scale to that number, that's about 3% of the U.S. CO2 emissions uh, in 2019. And so again, uh, the potential for, for a positive impact here, but you know, in the broader scheme of things, we're talking about a relatively uh, small portion of current emissions. So let's think about this a little more concretely from a row crop producer's perspective. Let's say you're a row crop producer who currently practices conservation tillage. If you move to no-till, that would sequester some additional carbon and you would be eligible for a payment, mm -hmm. right? but it would be incremental. It would be the difference between conservation and no-till, right? Mm -hmm. So, right. and then going beyond that, if you use cover crops, you'd be eligible for an additional payment beyond that. So that's, that brings in that whole idea of additionality. But again, that's been controversial because some of the farmers in the U.S. that have been adopting these practices to improve soil health, et cetera, are concerned that they're not gonna be able to be compensated. And yet that additionality principle suggests that's actually appropriate, right? So right. That's, that's the rub, I guess, for a lot of people. So I think a lot of our viewers know that monthly we survey farmers across the nation as part of the Purdue University CME Group Ag Economy Barometer. So we survey 400 commercial farmers every month across the nation, and they are not the same people every month. So we survey different people every month, but we do hold the characteristics of the people that we survey each month uh, constant to, to maintain uh, some comparability across not only months, but across years as well. And for several months, we asked a series of questions about carbon in addition to our, our baseline questions that we ask as part of the Ag Economy Barometer. So in February, March, and April, uh, we asked some questions about whether or not people are aware of opportunities to receive payments for capturing carbon on their farms. Um, a majority of people uh, were not aware, but there was a sizable minority that said they were actually uh, aware of some opportunities. Then we followed up with the folks that said, that, said, that said they were aware of opportunities. We followed up with them and said, have you actively engaged in discussions regarding receiving payments? And again, um, a relatively small percentage of the total said they had, but the, nevertheless, there were enough out there to gather some additional information. And so we followed up with them and said, have you signed a contract to capture carbon on your farm? And very few people have actually signed the contract, at least based on our survey. And, and it, that's all across three different months. So we surveyed roughly 1,200 people total. And out of that, as you can see on the slide, only 16 people said that they had actually signed the contract. And so just to put that in the con that's 1%. Right, so 1% of the 1,200 uh, people that we talked to had actually signed a contract. So I, I think oftentimes when I'm talking to producers, you know, they hear a lot of talk about the, the carbon um, sequestration in these contracts, but it's useful to know 
that, that not a large majority of your neighbors have actually signed one of these contracts, right? Yeah, very few. In fact, when we looked at the monthly responses, this is the aggregation across three months of surveys, individually, month by month, that was very consistent. Yeah. It basically stayed right at that 1%. Um, so then we also followed up and said, you know, if, if you chose not to sign a contract, why are you choosing not to participate? And the number one response was not enough money, yeah. right? The payment level simply wasn't high enough. Roughly almost two thirds of the people that, that responded to that said that uh, it simply wasn't high enough money. Um, some people were concerned about the legal liability, right? Uh, we had a variety of other considerations, a uh, wide range of things there. Uh, some people were skeptical about the whole idea of carbon sequestration, whether or not this really was perhaps going to be a longer term thing. Um, a small percentage, about one out of five, said that they had, uh, were ineligible because they were already doing those practices, things like uh, conservation tillage, no-till, or, or using cover crops, and as a result, because of the additionality principle, weren't really weren't uh, eligible. Uh, and we were a little surprised at this. I guess no one said that there was a problem with the fact that they'd already received payment to do things mm -hmm. uh, from either state or federal government. And Carson, you might talk a little bit about that. That's been a little bit of an issue in, in the literature, whether or not that's appropriate, right? That's right, yeah. So that refers to this idea, uh, somewhat derisively called double dipping, otherwise called uh, credit stacking, right? So uh, the, the federal government, when it uh, makes conservation payments, they are very, very nervous about this issue of credit stacking, where if we're going to pay you to do something, you should not be allowed to go out and get paid to do the same thing by somebody else, right? And it makes sense, right? We don't want to spend a whole lot of money uh, in, in double payments for something that people would have done for one payment, right? Uh, from an economic efficiency standpoint, that doesn't really matter as much. Uh, we, we want to have people clean up the environment as long as the marginal benefits are up to the point where the marginal benefits equal the marginal costs of cleaning up the environment. So uh, if you think about these payments being, you know, reflecting the marginal uh, benefits of doing something, as long as the marginal benefits add up to what they should be at that efficient level, collect as many payments as you want, right? It, it shouldn't really matter, but there is a lot of concern, uh, not only among, you know, federal government and the USDA, but also a lot of, um, increasingly a lot of private carbon markets are imposing these rules to try and ban double dipping and prevent people from collecting multiple um, payments for the same thing. And so in our survey, that might have been captured by people that responded about the previous use of eligible practices, right? That's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So Nathan, uh, I think probably what a lot of our viewers are interested in is how much money was being offered out there, right? Sure. So we asked that question on the barometer survey, both in the uh, March and April uh, surveys, and so you might share those results. Yeah, so again, just coming back to this idea of price being offered really being the main impediment here, we followed up and asked those who had sat down and, and talked to one of these companies uh, about a potential contract to sequester carbon on their farms, what sort of prices were they being offered? And so you can see kind of the distribution of those responses here, right? About uh, 40% less than $10 an acre, another 40% between 10 and 20. So that puts you at, you know, 84% less than $20 an acre. Uh, and then we had, you know, uh, 15, 16% that were above that with a very small group uh, being uh, above $30 an acre. And so as you think about this idea of price, it's, it's interesting. So, you know, obviously as economists, we know that price is, is determined by both supply and demand. And if you think about what's going on uh, in, in these carbon markets, really supply is, is lagging demand, I would argue. Uh, and, and what I mean by that is, you know, you can just go uh, on the internet and every day there's a new company coming out and making these carbon neutral pledges. Uh, and so whatever, pick the company that you want. Um, and so while, again, those are voluntary commitments and, and there's not a lot of um, uh, repercussions if they weren't to do that. There's at least a, a, a group of people that are lining up to make commitments to buy these credits. When we think about supply of those credits, uh, we run into this issue of we just uh, showed that at least uh, based on our survey, only about 1% of the farmers that we talked to had actually signed up to supply uh, credits to these markets. And so, you know, we have to kind of think about the, the supply and the demand situation. The other question that comes up here is, well, I just mentioned these are voluntary commitments, and so how, how sustainable is the demand, right? So how long are these companies gonna be willing uh, to buy these credits uh, from an agricultural offset source? 
and at what price are they going to be willing to pay, right? And so obviously what, what's currently being offered, which is somewhat arbitrary in the sense of how thin these markets are and, and the variation across them, um, producers in our survey told us it wasn't enough to get, to get them excited uh, and to participate. And so again, you know, if you look at the current range, I would say most uh, of the, the companies are somewhere in that $10 to $20 per metric ton of carbon uh, is what they're paying. Now, obviously, you have to convert that to per acre terms by multiplying by the amount of carbon that actually gets sequestered by these different practices. And again, that's highly variable, and, and, and the soil scientists uh, have some ranges out there, but those ranges are quite wide, ranging from you know, uh, zero to over one metric ton uh, per acre, and you can go to various sources to look at either an estimate for your area. So I mentioned the NRCS's COMET tool, C-O-M-E-T, is online, and you can go look at in your county what a particular practice would be expected to sequester. Um, or there are other studies that kind of you know put all that information in one place as kind of a meta-analysis. But what I think is useful is it's one thing to, to think about prices being offered multiplied by a sequestration rate. It's another thing to think about, all right, well, what would we actually have to pay farmers to, to adopt these practices? And that's something that people have actually looked at from, from an ag econ research point of view. And so we actually had some colleagues here at Purdue that did a survey several years ago where they were looking, again, at that point in time, the carbon thing was much more hypothetical, uh, but they were essentially wanting to see how much would they have to pay farmers in order to get them to switch from conventional till to no-till. And so again, this was a survey of farmers in the state of Indiana and they basically estimated that for the farmers in their survey that the on average you'd have to pay them forty dollars an acre to make that switch from conventional tillage um, to no-till which is is an interesting number to know just to have some context there but if you wanted to then convert that to kind of a, a carbon payment scheme you have to say okay well what does that translate to in terms of a carbon price so again you got to make an assumption about that carbon uh, sequestration rate so here just for easy math I said, okay, well, what if you could sequester one half or one metric ton per acre per year? So that one metric ton would be pretty, pretty ambitious. The half ton uh, would probably be more realistic. Uh, so that translates to a, a carbon uh, price of $40 for the one ton or $80 for the half uh, metric ton of sequestration that would need it, be needed um, in order to, to incentivize the producer to actually participate. And so compare that, right, $40 to $80 per metric ton to where we're currently at, at $10 to $20 per metric ton. And you can see there's, there's a pretty big gap there in terms of where that price currently is. And so when you do that sort of, you know, just kind of back of the envelope math, it shouldn't be too surprising to see that most farmers in our survey said, you know, price just wasn't enough to get them excited to participate. So that's kind of how I look at the price uh, story there. So maybe the corollary to that is also to think, uh, you know, we've seen some, some analogies here with respect to some other issues in agriculture going back a number of years. Think about uh, hog contracting, for example. <clears throat> in the early stages, uh, many of those contracts from a producer perspective weren't terribly attractive, yeah. right? And from the company perspective, they were putting contracts out there and trying to determine how much interest there was in the contracts, right? I suspect we're probably at that stage in these carbon markets where the companies are just trying to figure out what is it going to take to attract a significant amount of interest, and we're probably going to see these prices change. Sure. I mean, who, who knows, right? Up, down, sideways. Uh, I, I think the other thing, too, I've heard it said this way, and you think about the audience here, you know, with current commodity prices, you know, we're looking at, at corn revenue, 800 easily $1,000 an acre. So. $10, $20 is just a really small, right. <laughs> a small number when you think about the broader scheme of, of uh, kind of the farm economy. And so I think that's something that these companies are going to have to wrestle with. Yeah, good point going forward. So some issues with respect to these contracts, and a lot of people have been asking us, you know, what, what are the contractual obligations to continue the practice? What, what have you found there? Yeah, so uh, one of the issues that we have to deal with, so Carson, Carson has mentioned the additionality principle associated with a, a carbon um, offset. The other really big piece that we have is permanence, right, that, that we like to talk about. And that's essentially the fact that when we store this carbon in the soil, uh, it's going to be there permanently, right? That would be the point. If we're offsetting kind of uh, carbon emissions from some other source in the economy, we need to know that that actually stays there. And the problem that we run into with uh, agriculture and really row crop agriculture in particular is that soil carbon 
is reversible, right? And so if you think about some of the practices that we've mentioned, tillage in particular, uh, a change from no-till, uh, excuse me, co conservation tillage to no-till sequesters carbon in the soil. But we know that that could be reversed. If we come back in and need to do tillage for whatever reason, uh, right? So you could think of a, a variety of uh, situations that might arise, whether that has to do with ruts in the field, has to do with a weed situation, where a farmer would come back in and do some tillage, that re-releases uh, that carbon. So it's not permanent, uh, and therefore we kind of run into a problem. And so, you know, the question is kind of, how are these carbon contracts going to handle these situations where we have uh, kind of a, a, a renig on uh, the agreement to a certain practice, such as tillage? And so it's, it's a little vague, um, I would say, but my understanding currently is that uh, a lot of the companies would tell you, you know, well, you don't have to pay back the payments. It's fine. We understand that there might be some extenuating circumstances where you needed to do this, but you have re-released the carbon. And so uh, the agreement is, okay, well, we're going to pause your payments. We're not going to pay you as the farmer uh, until you've been able to re-sequester whatever carbon you released when you uh, had that tillage event because of whatever reason. And so the farmer would have to wait however many years to, to kind of build back up the carbon stocks that they had been previously paid for, and then they'll resume the payments. And while that sounds great in theory, uh, in practice, I'm, I'm, I'm wary that that's a little more complicated because you, know, you have a situation where the farmer uh, has to get in and, and, and kind of revert and re-release some of this carbon. Uh, okay, well, we're going to pause your payments. The farmer has very little incentive to continue doing that practice, right? He or she probably is not going to want to continue uh, no-tilling without the incentive uh, of the payment that they've been receiving. And so if they are unwilling to continue the practice, even in the absence of the payment, the question is, well, what, what are they obligated? And, and likely, right, uh, they're going to have to buy back uh, the credits they had previously sold at, at whatever the market price is, which depending on the situation, could be very expensive. And so, you know, again, we see legal liability show up in our survey as a kind of a, a thing that farmers are concerned about, and, and I think it's a legitimate concern. And again, I'm not an expert in these contracts. I haven't thoroughly reviewed them, but I, I have talked to producers that have mentioned that these are kind of some of the hangups that they're worried about, is this legal liability piece uh, of uh, needing to continue the practice permanently for the life of the contract. Yeah, and from, from my, it's a, clear-cut case where you can see both sides have legitimate stakes in this, legitimate interest. The companies that are providing the carbon uh, contracts are saying, well, you know, we're in the business of sequestering carbon. That's what we care about. The farmers are saying, well, my primary business is I'm producing corn or soybeans, right? right? And so there's that little tug of war going on between those two, and that's uh, not fully resolved as how sure. I would put that at the moment. There's some variability there. Uh, the other issue here is how long are the contracts, and I guess you both have kind of looked at this a little bit, but, you know, if you think about it, getting back to this idea that the sequestration is reversible, that means these contracts, for them really to be successful and have an impact on the climate, need to be long term. That's right. There's some, there's some minor amount of research out there that look, tries to look at the value of pausing carbon emissions, right? If you do sequester carbon and then till it up 10 years from now re-release it is there some value from having waited to to re-release that maybe but yeah it's a very important issue and and uh you know and the a lot of the programs we're looking at i mean 20 years here is actually probably a little bit on the long side a lot of the ones i've heard of are 10 years you know maybe five years and so it's uh uh, it's not a lot of time, especially when we're talking about a greenhouse gas that has effects on the scale of hundreds to thousands of years. Uh, so that's an important issue. So there's a little bit of information, I guess, coming out of Australia, and I, I wasn't aware of this until just recently, but they've actually had an emissions reduction fund that's focused on initially on 100-year contracts. You might talk a little bit about that, Nathan. Yeah, so, I mean, it's really interesting to put into context what's currently happening in, in these U.S. Uh, carbon markets again, specifically focusing on the ones dealing with, with kind of row crop agriculture as their focus, like Carson mentioned, you know, they're somewhere between one and 20 year contracts is kind of what you're seeing currently. But when you look at what they're doing in, in Australia, and again, th this is kind of their national uh, attempt at um, uh, reducing uh, carbon emissions and, and combating climate change. So this includes agriculture, but is not, um, is not exclusive to just agriculture. The, the program they have started out with 100-year contracts. And so, again, this is the, the permanence issue at play, right? They were very concerned with making sure that whatever offsets that they were going to provide in their carbon market were 
at least uh, a really good attempt at being permanent. 100 years is, is a pretty uh, serious attempt. Um, now, they did come back and revise that. I don't think that they got the participation that they had initially hoped for. Uh, and so they, they introduced a 25-year contract, but they were very clear that those were going to come at a, a, um, a, a reduced payment rate. Right? So you weren't going to get the same rate per metric ton of carbon for the 25-year contract that you would be getting um, for the 100-year contract. And so, again, we see this trade-off between permanence and price, and, and we run into this issue of if, if we're going to have these kind of short-term programs, 5, 10, even 20 years, um, we're going to run into issues with, okay, well, I'm only willing to pay, as, as the buyer of those offsets, I'm only willing to pay so much if I know those offsets are not going to be permanent. Uh, and, and so we kind of, you know, we're in this cycle of, well, I don't want to sign up for too long. Well, I'm not going to pay you a high price. And, and it can be a little bit concerning as you think about where these markets might be going. So we, we continue to kind of point to some issues suggesting that although there's a lot of interest in row crop agriculture about these carbon sequestration payments, it's very clear it's early days sure. with respect to the evolution of how this market is going to play out, right? That's right, yeah. And I think it's, there's no, it's no accident that historically carbon markets have not involved row crop agriculture because, we're, I mean, you talk about uh, putting, pushing pause on your payments for no-till. Uh, we don't really have a good sense of how carbon levels change in soil from year to year anyway. So the science even around this is, is still at a relatively early stage. I don't know it myself, but that's, that's what you hear from a lot of the agronomists that we're not sure what we're measuring or how consistently it's measured. And you know, there's lots of issues. Yeah, so let's look at that a little more detail. Mm -hmm. You've taken a look at this, Carson. Do I qualify if I'm already using eligible production practices? And the answer is in general, no, right? That's right. So a, a certain number of programs do have certain uh, look-back periods, they call it. So if you are somebody who's adopted no-till, hey, I've been running it on my farm for five years or 10 years or 15 years, now all of a sudden you're going to pay people to do this thing that I did uh, and I have been doing already, uh, why aren't I getting some benefit to that, right? That's the question a lot of people raise. And so a, a number of programs have started this uh, look-back period where we will pay you, you know, for the for the carbon you've sequestered in the last five years through no-till say um, from my understanding just from conversations with you all is that that's uh, not everybody necessarily qualifies there's re relatively few people who actually do get that full buyback uh, look back period excuse me uh, but that is an issue that might also plague participation in these things yeah it's pretty rare so far at least as far as we can tell we didn't actually ask that question on the right. barometer but we might in a future survey yeah You've also taken a look at just how this whole carbon sequestration potential kind of plays out over time with respect to, you know, how, how you can expect change to occur. You might elaborate right. on that a little yeah, bit. Yeah, so the, the capacity of soils to sequester carbon is necessarily finite. You can only jam so much carbon into these things. Uh, and this is just a, this is a diagram we, we borrowed from a, another study, uh, as you can see on the screen there. But it, it shows sort of the dynamics of carbon storage in soil where initially you get a lot of carbon stored in those first couple of years, but after, in this case here, it's about, uh, what, 60 years or so, that starts to level off, and all of a sudden, no matter how much or how little tillage you're doing, you're not going to cram any more uh, carbon in those soils. So, um, you know, there there is a limit to uh, how much and how long we should probably be paying people to sequester carbon as well. Yeah, those are long-term issues, but mm -hmm. I, to me, as I look at that uh, chart, uh, Carson, it, it suggests that you know you might think about well, as you get closer to that theoretical maximum, there might still need to be a payment be made to maintain to it. maintain it. That's right. But that's probably not the same payment that needs to be made in those early years to mm -hmm. initiate change in production practices. Right. That's right. Yeah. And that's going to be one of the issues going forward. So, so the other thing here that that kind of uh, raises some red flags for me, I guess, is is this idea of it's finite, sequestration is finite, and increasing at a decreasing rate, meaning we, we, we store the most early on. And so we, we have a little bit of a problem here from an incentive point of view, and that is, you know, we're trying to sign farmers up to store carbon today at 10 to $20 per metric ton, but oftentimes you'll hear, well, we really think that the price of carbon is gonna be 50 or $80 per metric ton by 2030 or, you know, pick, pick the year. And so if I'm a farmer and I'm sitting here looking at this, this curve of, of how the, the physical uh, sequestration goes and I'm listening to kind of the, 
the talking heads on what carbon price is going to be, well, why, why would I sell my carbon today for $15 per metric ton when I could wait and sell it for more later? That's exactly what the chart shows. That is that you, know, you could wait and you really reach the same peak because of the shape of the curve. Um, and so I, I think that's something we have to be careful of. The other thing that we, you know, in, in economics, we have uh, this theory of the option value of waiting, right? And so sometimes when there's uncertainty associated with uh, a particular decision, there's value in waiting for the uncertainty to resolve. And so I think that we have to be careful as we look at kind of the uncertainties um, in these markets and, and we maybe see some farmers that choose not to participate. Uh, there's a reason why. Uh, and there's a, there's a high value of waiting to see what's going to happen as it relates to both the carbon price as well as what's going to happen uh, as it relates to kind of the maturity of these markets and, and, and kind of what, what the ultimate goal or how they shape up or what um, involvement we get from maybe government or something else, right? So there's, there's certainly value in waiting to see what's going to happen when you look at this curve and you compare it to what you hear kind of out in the, the industry. You, you mentioned a word that we're going to talk about later, and that is government, because yeah. that's one of the things that's up in the air with respect to what the level of government involvement might be in these markets and how that might impact things. Okay. So one of the other questions, though, that comes up a lot is who pays for verification? And am, am I actually paid for the carbon that's stored on my farm? And so I guess, Carson, you probably looked at that quite a bit. Yeah, so the companies uh, themselves, uh, the, the ones that are running the um, carbon markets are the ones that are paying for the verification in this, uh, in this case. And, and they're not actually sampling carbon, right? You're not, uh, you don't, they don't send somebody out with a bunch of test tubes and they're not dissolving soil in a, a vial trying to figure out how much carbon is in there. Uh, most of it, by and large, is... Uh, you know, they determine your carbon sequestration from the result of a, a simulation by a bioeconomic model, or sorry, a biogeochemical model. Um, it's a question of how much you trust that, right? There's a lot of, uh, you know, undoubtedly there are good models out there and things like that. Every uh, company has their own proprietary model, it seems like, that they're using to determine these payments. Uh, but to answer your question in a short way, you're not getting paid for the carbon that you're storing. You're getting paid for the imputed guess at what how much carbon you're storing on your land. Yeah, and that's you, you mentioned that they're not sampling. There is some sampling data involved, yes. but they're definitely not going out and sampling every farm, every acre. Right, every uh, acre or there's every There's a reasonable chance they might not sample any of your acres, but they have done some sampling that mm -hmm. they've used to develop the models. Mm -hmm. But different companies have different models, and there's a lack of standardization, I guess, is kind of what we're getting at. There and is, yeah. They, they measure carbon at different depths of the soil profile. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of, it's, it's the Wild West in terms of verification. Yeah. So looking ahead, let's talk about some of the issues. And I, I said some, because there's more issues than what we're going to cover here, but some of the big issues. And one of the issues that comes up is this whole issue about land tenure, mm -hmm. particularly leased versus owned crop acres, right? And so how is continuity of carbon sequestration ensured? That's really, you know, how's that going to work out? Current contracts are with the farm operator. Uh, what happens when cropland changes hands, either by a change in ownership or just a change in the lease? And, you know, we do some leasing surveys here in Indiana. A lot of leases are on one-year basis. Yeah. Some of them are a little longer, three to five years. I mean, and... And I rec recognize that even a lot of those one-year leases wind up being farmed by the same person for many years. But nevertheless, and from a legal perspective, it's a relatively short-term lease. That's one of the issues, right? Because as you pointed out, Carson, this is a long-term issue, right? Mm -hmm. um, so it's unclear how that's going to play out. What's, what's your... Yeah, it is. I mean, it, this is a question that, that I frequently hear from people. On, well, can I you know, sign a carbon contract on leased acres? And, and the answer is yes. I mean, most, most companies will allow that. And so it, it is possible. But as you mentioned, I, I think it raises some, some you know, important issues that are going to have to be dealt with. I mean, basically my understanding, and again, I think it varies from, from company to company in terms of these, these carbon uh, contracts. Uh, but typically, they're going to want to see that if you're going to uh, sign a, a carbon contract on leased acres, that you can show some uh, management control. So you're going to have to have the landlord you know, write a letter or give an agreement that um, you're going to be allowed to, to receive the payments for the carbon that's sequestered on the farm. But again, you mentioned you know, um, mo <laughs> most leases that we deal with are on a year-to-year -year basis. And so even if you've been farming that ground for a long time, how these companies are going to you know, look at a, a year to year or even just a verbal agreement on your lease 
it's probably going to take more than that. Uh, is that something you're willing to do? Is that something your landlord is willing to do? Is going to be an interesting problem. And then again, you know, circles back to the additionality problem that we talked about earlier. And that, well, it's not really the additionality problem, but the problem of you know what acres are available. And so if if we if we're challenged in in like oh, okay on leased acres, this is just too many problems to figure out. That takes out 50% of acres, right? So in the U.S., cropland acres, 50% of the, the acres that are farmed are, are leased. <laughs> and so that's a huge portion of the potential acres to, to enroll in these carbon programs that have some serious issues to, to figure out before they're able to really kind of be a, a major part or an integral part of these programs. Uh, the second issue, which you've already mentioned, is the additionality requirement. And I know Secretary Vilsack has commented, I think, um, I don't think I have an actual quote, but along the lines of, He's concerned about not providing incentives to people that are already doing good things or maybe mm. providing disincentives to people that are already doing good things from a soil management perspective. But it's, it's an issue, right? For yeah, and there are al allegedly ways that they can verify that if you do till up your land uh, with this sort of self-serving goal of um, qualifying for carbon payments in the future, they can tell you've done that so you don't you disqualify yourself from these programs. Uh, I don't know how they do that off the top of my head. Um, but it's, you know, so there might be some incentives to cheat. Uh, also, you know, you have to think about it from a, from a social perspective. We talked about, you know, we're, when we're talking about carbon trading, you know, the, the ideal is we look at this trying to maximize the net gains to society from managing these things. Uh, from a social perspective, should we even be paying people for good things they've already done, right? If they've already adopted those practices, then at the end of the day, we have to look at it and say, well, they, they benefited somewhat from that, otherwise they wouldn't have done it in the first place. Should we be going back and actually paying these guys for things that they've already done? Yeah, it's a, it's, it, that's a debate that's gonna continue. I, yeah. I don't see that one going away. No. Um, and then you kind of mentioned the whole contract enforcement issue, right? That's, that's a little unclear in terms of how that's gonna play out, but it's an issue that people are concerned about. and, and you know, if you violate one aspect of the of the contract, what does that mean, and how's that going to be uh, dealt with over time? Especially as it relates to tillage and things like that. You mm -hmm. know, as, as this is all about climate change, right? And so, as the climate gets more variable, we're going to have higher rainfall. You're going to get more rutting, or you might not be able to get your cover crop in, or whatever. So, there's going to be lots of uh, and an increasing amount of variability in whether you're not whether you're able to actually comply with these contracts. Yeah, that's a good point. Well, let's talk a little bit about the future. Uh, we're kind of gazing into the crystal ball just a little bit here, but we're going to try and do that. So let's look at some alternatives and consequences. Um, in the short run, it looks like the private carbon markets are going to continue to dominate. Do you agree with that? Yeah. Carson? That's right. Um, so tell us what that means. Well, in the absence of any uh, government uh, effort to try and have sort of a, a federal or even state level carbon markets, uh, this is all going to be 100% voluntary. And right now, the, the private uh, the Norries, the, um, you know, Bayers and, and those companies of the world, they're the ones driving this demand for carbon permits, so. And in turn, what that means is that those, you mentioned some consumer-facing companies, mm -hmm. uh, are really going to be driving the demand, right? right. So it's going to be the, you know, used examples of Apple and Microsoft, but there's a whole host of companies out there that have made public pronouncements about their desire yeah. to reduce their carbon footprint over a period of time, mm -hmm. uh, most of them trying to become carbon neutral by some point in the date in the future. Um, that's being driven by a combination of consumer demand mm -hmm. pushing them in that direction. In some cases, it's their investors pushing them in that direction. But that's really what's going to drive those markets, right? And that's that, right. that suggests, um, well, I think I was talking to you recently, Nathan, you kind of expressed some concern about how long that might be, right? Uh, with respect to, are people going to continue to push for that if they're not convinced it's sure. having an impact? I think that the, the, the ultimate kind of telltale for that kind of scenario is the, the question of the quality of the offsets, right? And so how long will the companies that are purchasing the off offsets or how long will the consumers who are pushing for the companies to buy those offsets um, believe in or, or, or be confident in what's happening in, in these programs, right? And so again, we've already talked about the issues with permanence, we've talked about the issues with additionality, and you know, Carson mentioned earlier, right? There's a reason that row crop agriculture has, has been excluded in the past from participating in these markets. I'm not saying that those, those issues aren't uh, able to be overcome and, and, and agriculture can, can play a role, but until those issues get resolved, 
you have this lingering concern over um, how long will the demand for those credits from row crop agriculture um, be sustainable, right? Yeah, will they be acceptable really to those companies, right? right? Yeah. That's really what we're talking about. So that leads us right into this idea of what might government's role be in the future. And of course, this is being debated to some extent right now in the halls of Congress. Uh, but let's just talk about some theoretical possibilities. So one of the issues we've discussed so far is this standardization issue, uh, standardization of measurement verification. Um, you know, what, what's, how's that going to play out over time, what yeah. do you think? Well, we, we'd be remiss probably, given where we are, if we don't mention the Gl Growing Climate Solutions Act. It was introduced, uh, reintroduced recently, apparently. Um, but uh, Senator Mike Braun from Indiana is the kind of leading the charge on this. Uh, and this is a, an effort basically uh, to give the USDA the ability to standardize and verify these. And I, I, in my own personal opinion is that would make a huge, uh, be a huge step forward in terms of adding some legitimacy to these and some, some longevity to these types of markets. Because as we mentioned, every company has a different way of measuring these things. If there was some standardization of this procedure that, that might be attained under a bill like this, that would go a long way in giving uh, the the people who are buying these permits the confidence that they are getting a high quality um, permit or offset in exchange for their money. So uh, an analogy there might be what USDA has done with respect to organic agriculture, right? Uh, there were people talking about producing organically for a number of years, but there was always a lack of confidence in terms of what the practices were. USDA came in and wound up establishing a set of standards, and if you meet the standards, you get the label, That's and right. you can convey that to consumers, and that created some consumer confidence with respect to those production practices. This might be a little bit like that. I don't yeah. want to push that analogy too far, but it, it, it could be a little bit like that. Yeah, I think it's a good one. Um, so that could potentially set the stage for carbon offsets for row crop agriculture being used not just in the non-regulated, but maybe even in the regulated markets, mm -hmm. is that? That's right. Yeah, so, so one theory that people play with in economics on the, on the academic side is that a lot of these um, voluntary sustainability efforts are geared towards avoiding regulation in the future. So one, one pessimistic way of looking at this might be a lot of these companies are seeing climate regulation come, come down the, the pipeline. And, and maybe it's not too far-fetched. I mean, the Biden administration, well, Biden was in the White House at one point already uh, when he was there under the Obama administration. They were the most aggressive uh, climate regulators our nation has ever known. And so people logically are saying, well, he's back in the White House. Maybe we're gonna see more action on this again in the future. So this might be a way of sort of establishing or, or getting ahead of, of federal regulations uh, that might be coming down the pipeline. But I guess uh, one thing I was thinking about is if, if a set of standards, uh, both on the measurement and verification side, come in play and, and actually make row crop agriculture eligible for mm -hmm. the offsets in the regulated markets, that would be a big demand boost, right? Yeah, for that sure. Would be, that would be a big thing if that could happen. That's right. Um, the other thing we th talked about briefly was the idea that uh, making information publicly available uh, on what's going on in these carbon markets might be useful. And I, the analogy there is what USDA's uh, Ag Marketing Service already does for other agricultural markets. One of the things our little survey did was uh, maybe shed a little bit light uh, on what the payments are, right? I mean, there's a, there's a lack of uh, information symmetry out there with yeah. respect to the companies and, and producers. So that might be an interesting thing uh, for them to at least think about. Um, Carson, you mentioned the possibility of a tax or a cap on carbon emissions that might drive change here. Yeah, so one of the big uh, challenges with this market and the reason there is this information asymmetry problem is that you have so many markets that are each run independently of one another. The advantage of those, those regulatory markets that I mentioned before is that they set one cap on, on carbon. Everybody trades under it. There is one price for a carbon permit that gets generated out of that, and everybody knows what it is. And so every, you know, every, that, that information problem that you mentioned is, is basically resolved by just having one single carbon cap that everybody's working with. Same thing would work under a tax. The problem with a tax, of course, people, you know, a lot of uh, uh, journalists and people like that like carbon taxes uh, because they're very simple, right? You don't have any of this trading that might happen, but under a tax, if you emit a ton of carbon dioxide, you pay $35 to the, the IRS or whatever, right? That's how these things work, basically. Uh, the disadvantage of a tax, other than, you know, everybody has to pay a cost under that, the disadvantage of a tax is that it doesn't really allow farmers to participate 
right? We don't really regulate carbon emissions from farmers. Nobody's ever talking about doing that. But the nice thing about a market is that it's a form of regulation where we control we can control emissions, but bring farmers under the under the umbrella of the regulation on a voluntary basis. So farmers stand to gain as long as they feel like participating in that market. Another way to think of that is it potentially allows us to reduce carbon emissions at the lowest possible cost. Exactly, right? yeah, that's right. It, it expands the scope of, of who we can, uh, whose emissions we can control mm -hmm. in a way that benefits farmers. Um, so what about some options for row crop producers that are kind of sitting there watching this webinar trying to figure out, well, what should I do, right? So uh, we came up with some questions, maybe a little bit of a decision tree for people to think about a little bit. So Nathan, you might walk through that a little. Yeah, so it really depends on a number of factors, and that's kind of you know, what our thinking was here. So I mean, I think the first thing you have to ask yourself is, you know, what are you currently doing in terms of production practices? And, and again, mainly, you know, where are you at on tillage, and where are you at on, on adoption of of cover crops, right? And so depending on whether or not you're using those or not, I think your your answer to kind of how you move forward would, would be different. So, you know, uh, for those that are using those practices, um, you know, what, what are your opportunities? I mean, we, we've said most of these programs, uh, at least publicly say that they're, um, um, they're gonna stick to an additionality principle, meaning they're wanting to enroll acres uh, that are not currently using those practices. Again, we've talked about there, there, there's some flexibility there that you know, these look back periods and things of that nature. But you know, if you have an option to, to enroll uh, in a program and you're already using those practices, I think that that's something that um, you know, you, you'd really wanna be asking yourself. You know, if, if you're gonna have to change production practices uh, to qualify, right? So if you're sitting here saying, all right, well, I, I, I don't currently use those practices or maybe I just use them on a small portion of my acres or something, but you know, I, I haven't really gone all in, then you, know, you gotta think about, okay, well, what is the cost associated with those practices, right? So you know, what is the cost benefit here? It's gonna cost me something to, to implement those and what is the benefit in terms of my participation in this carbon market? And then, you know, what are, the, what are the contract terms? And I think that's a really important one, whether that's the price, because again, that price is gonna factor into that cost benefit analysis. But then I also think length of the contract. So you know, we've talked about a number of the aspects of these markets, you know, while maybe these short-term contracts don't line up well with a permanence mentality of storing the carbon permanently, you know, they do offer farmers an opportunity to maybe get in at a low risk, uh, I think would be one way to think about it. And so. You know, if, if you're being offered, you know, a, a reasonable price and a, a relatively short-term contract, that might be something that you would be willing to consider versus, you know, if you're looking at a 20-year contract on cover crops and you've never planted a cover crop in your life, I, I would be much more wary of, of that being your first foray into it. Uh, and that, that's just kind of my opinion on that matter. But that's, that, that's kind of the, the sequence of things that I think farmers probably should be thinking about. You know, thinking about uh, what you were just saying there, Nathan, I guess I had an opportunity to visit with a farm not too long ago who viewed it along the lines you did, which with respect to um, it was an opportunity for them to get a small payment to try a production practice. In their case, it was the use of cover crops that they had been thinking about doing but hadn't actually done. And so it allowed them, it gave them a, a small or modest financial incentive to do something they kind of wanted to do anyway and so, and it wasn't a real long term. And so it was an opportunity to do something they kind of wanted to do. They got an incentive to do it um, and learn a little bit about how it works. And then uh, they didn't enroll all their acres. Again, that's another key point. Yeah. If you're a farmer, you don't have to enroll everything, right? You can do some things on a trial basis to learn some things. So there's some opportunities there. Um, so the last point you mentioned was what contract terms are being offered. Um, you know, I think as we think about what's going on in this market, or in these markets, we said a couple different times, this is early days. Mm -hmm. It's gonna change. Um, looking at my crystal ball, if I had to guess, if this is gonna be successful in row crop agriculture, the payment rates are probably gonna rise. Do you guys agree with that? Yep. That was, that was a pretty quick answer, yeah. Carson. Yeah. Yeah, so keep that in mind. That's not based on a tremendous amount of information, but if you look at his, the history of this kind of stuff going on elsewhere in agriculture, in early days, it's an opportunity for um, markets to converge on an equilibrium. And I don't think we've converged on equilibrium yet. That's kind of, and that, our survey kind of supports that with that 1% that has only signed contracts so far. 
So looking ahead, the, maybe the, the elephant in the room here is what's the likelihood of more direct government involvement in this and what might that look like? That's, that's probably the issue, I think, on a lot of our viewers' minds. Uh, what, what do you think is going to happen there? That's pure speculation, I guess, on our part. With yeah. Carson, I'll start I, with you. I mean, we're already kind of seeing it, again, with that Growing Climate Solutions Act. I think there's, it's gotten people's attention. If it's coming out of such a red state in Indiana, it's, you know, it's got to be uh, catching on other places as well, uh, this idea of managing the uh, carbon emissions. Um, and again, with, with Bi uh, Biden administration having already been part of the most aggressive carbon uh, regulating administration in U.S. history, it's, it's coming. It's coming. Uh, it's just a matter of what it's going to look like. And so what, what do you think it will look like? Do you think it's going to focus on standardization and verification? Do you think those will be the main issues or is it going to be broader than that? I think, I think at some level, this is just, again, me, like you said, looking into the crystal ball. Uh, I think at some level the government is going to have to step in and uh, actually coordinate a lot of this trading. Because, again, the, the big problem is if you just leave this up to a bunch of private companies to run this, there, there's just there's going to be a lot of issues with that. Nobody's going to know what prices are. There's lots of information asymmetry. I can get a higher value for my, my carbon sequestered if I go over here than if I go over there. There's lots of these questions that, that might arise from this. And, and at the end of the day, what we're fundamentally dealing with is an externality, right? The, uh, by that I mean this is affecting uh, everybody the same, and it's, it's the, a consequence of something that people don't really pay attention to in the marketplace um, too much, right? The, the carbon emissions are things that come out when I'm driving my car to work or when I'm turning my, my lights on for electricity. Uh, an externality is a, a consequence to society that happens uh, to people outside that market transaction. This is, this is fundamentally a role for government to, uh, to manage. Uh, and I think, frankly, they can probably do it in a more coordinated and, and uh, more rigorous way than just having a bunch of different companies all try to figure it out at the same time. Nathan, I'm going to turn to you. I mean, I don't have anything quite that formal, but I, I, I think that the tea leaves are definitely leaning in the direction of government involvement. And, you know, to the question of like, what does that look like? I mean, you know, who, who knows in the long term, but I think in the short term, it starts with the standardization piece, right? I mean, like all the reasons that Carson gave, I mean, that's, that's the problem that's kind of keeping, I think, um, these markets back is there needs to be some sort of consistency there. Uh, and again, that, that helps on both the supply and the demand side, right? And so it helps farmers be more confident uh, in participating, and then it also helps uh, in terms of these companies that are wanting to purchase these offsets being confident in the offset. So, you know, I think it, it definitely starts there. Where it goes from there, you know, I, I don't really know. That's kind of where I come out. I think government role clearly could uh, see some beneficial impact mm -hmm. resulting from um, uh, providing the standardization verification uh, role which would really facilitate markets, yeah. right? And, and enable markets to operate more efficiently, which has long been the role of, uh, for example, the Ag Marketing Service at USDA. So in that sense, very consistent with some of the things that USDA has been involved in for many, many years. So um, we don't know what's gonna happen, but that's, that's our guess as of today. So uh, with that, I'm gonna wrap up our, our webinar today. Uh, I encourage you to visit our website, purdue.edu slash commercial ag. We'll have a copy of the white paper based on the, the presentation we did today available on the website next week. Um, those of you that are watching this uh, live, we'll be also sending out an email uh, when the slides are available and, the, and hopefully when that uh, white paper is available and you can kind of read through that for some more details on, in addition to just looking at the slides. And so with that, I want to thank my colleagues, Nathan Thompson and Carson Reeling for joining us today. And on behalf of the Center for Commercial Agriculture, I'm Jim Mintert.